Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ann Cuppinger. I'm with the Community Technical Assistance Center. And on behalf of the wonderful team that I have with me today, I want to welcome you to the third webinar in our series on the art of supervision. And this one's about YPA or Youth Peer Advocate Supervision through a recovery and resiliency lens. So we are just thrilled that you're with us today. So if um, we're, you're here from all different places, it would be terrific if you could open up the chat at the bottom of the screen there and uh, let us know who you are, what agency you're with and where you are in the great state of New York. Um, if you're here from another state, welcome. Um, and in, as you're doing that, um, I just want to reassure everyone that um, the slides uh, for today will be um, posted on our website within a couple days. You'll get an email. Um, and also on the website will be the recording of today's webinar. So you don't have to take fast and furious notes. You can sit back and really, um, we hope, engage with the conversation today. Um, and all of this information that you see here will be uh, shared with you shortly. So um, it's really great to see a lot of people. I see a lot of people have come back from our last webinar. That's great. And I also see some new faces. So um, welcome and thanks so much for, um, for joining us today. Um, I'm going to have Vanessa launch this poll, and in the poll, we're asking you to tell us, you know, kind of what role you play with respect to the important work of youth peer advocates. Excellent. We've got four of you answering the poll. If we can get everybody else in there answering the poll, we'll have a more accurate information about who's here today. So yeah, one of them was me, so that doesn't count. So okay, <laughs> those little dots. All right, well, I don't wanna to take too much time with this, but I see a mix of people here. We've got um, both YPAs who are supervising and other people who are supervising YPAs. We have some of you up and coming YPA leaders um, and other folks who are looking, I hope, to learn more about youth peer support. So I'm gonna end that poll. I think that will share the results so the rest of you can see what I was seeing there. And um, here we go, we'll off to learning today. So, um, the only other thing I want to share with you is that um, when you get these slides, you'll be able to click on this link and you can register for the other webinars in this series. Um, we have had to change the, the November 9th webinar. That's going to be rescheduled for November 14th um, at 11, and we'll send you that information. So you don't need to remember that, but I just want to give you a little bit of a heads up. Um, you you know, depending on the size of this group, we may have the ability to have you, uh, you know, unmute yourselves and, and chat um, during the large group. We're going to have one breakout session when we absolutely want you to unmute yourselves and chat. Um, but you can, you know, do whatever makes sense given the conversation. You can use the chat box or um, if you have something that you want to say in response to one of the questions that's posed today, we hope you'll just unmute yourself and, and weigh in. Oh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, the team. Okay, so welcome everybody. It's great to see you here. I'm Edie Schwartz, and um, along with my team of Anne and Nivia, uh, Tiara and Robbie, we are going to begin to delve into supervision through a recovery and resiliency lens. And what I mean by that is going to become a little bit clearer as we move along. Um, I want to just repeat what Anne said. There's four or five um, slides in here where I'm really looking for input. And you can give it any way you're comfortable giving it. You know, you can unmute and speak. Um, you can write it in the chat box. We're all watching the chat box. Um, you can unmute yourself and blurt it on right out. But I think that the only way to really make this alive is to have conversation about it. And you'll see that among our team, we'll be conversing back and forth. Um, people will be interrupting each other to say, hey, I have something to say about that. Or, you know, um, I agree with you so much, or I really don't agree with that statement. And that's great because it's conversation that gets us to begin to understand not what it means. We all know what it means. Recovery, resilience, or mom and apple pie. Yeah. But the thing to learn is, how do I make this a part of me and the work I do? That is trickier. Okay, so I'm going to begin by asking a couple of those questions. 
So let's take a minute and reflect on this, okay? So I have four questions to sort of throw at you. And we'll do one at a time. What do you believe recovery resilience to mean? What is it? What is it not? Um, oh, it's three questions, excuse me. And how is it the same or different from treatment or rehabilitation? So let's start with what do you believe recovery resilience to mean in our work? What does that mean to you guys? Blurt it out, hey, type it in. So it's So hey, it's Tiara. Um, I know yeah. for me, um, I learned about recovery at Youth Power um, over 10 years ago and I learned about it in mental health. Then I went over into the Oasis world where I learned more about substance use recovery and for me, I found it outside of the Samson definition. It was like finding my purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Like helping someone find their purpose. For me, it was establishing a sense of control, right? And being able to, to work within my purpose, right? And, and having hope for the future. So when I think of recovery those and resilience, those are some things for me that come to mind. Oh, that's perfect. Absolutely perfect. I agree with you. What is it not, guys? What is, what is recovery and resilience? What isn't recovery? That's a, hard to say. What isn't recovery and resilience? Hi, this is Laura. Um, Hi, Laura. I think that recovery resilience is not tolerating poor behavior or when someone is trying to um, break your boundaries that you're trying to set. Just, be, just for the sake of their own recovery or you feel like you have to in your recovery. Um, I still feel like being firm and what's okay and what's not okay is, you know, really important for those. Mm-hmm. Um, someone had typed in about the, what do you believe recovery uh, to resonate with the message of hope and wellness? So just want to get that in there. Um, so anything else about re what recovery is not? Thank you, Laura. This is Jacqueline is Pittman. Jackie, hey, Jackie. Hi, Jackie. Hi, She's back. Um, recovery and resilience is not blaming or shaming. No mm -hmm. matter what step or process the person is in. Good point. Good point. Um, it's also not transporting people back and forth to their therapist and their doc or getting them to take their medicine. Um, that's yeah, not recovery yeah. and resilience either. Um, how is it the same or different from treatment or rehab? Hab or anything else that we offer. Lori put in the chat, recovery is not stagnant. Um, yes, that's great. And here's someone saying, reflecting and digging into the why for the person and the process of how they can be with who they are and what experiences have happened to them. I agree. So just this last one, how do you think it's the same or different from treatment or rehab or, you know, what are the things that are the same about it? What are the things that are different? Hello? It is not the same for everyone. Sorry, this Charlene. It's not the same for everyone. There are many paths to recovery. This is Charlene Payne. Hi, Charlene. Um, this is the difference between uh, recovery and treatment is the way it's it, it, it's handed out. Treatment is a plan. Recovery is self-motivated. Recovery begins when the person says recovery begins. Mm -hmm. Treatment is a treatment plan that's done with counselors. And it really has little to do with recovery. It has everything to do with treatment, meaning that these are uh, uh, people that are educated in treatment, whereas recovery, works with a wellness plan. And those are the distinct differences between treatment and recovery. One is a recovery plan and the other is a treatment plan. And they're just two different things. Mm. And someone's written, it's not the same for everyone. And it doesn't hold the same meaning. I'm gonna add to that. Um, it says recovering resilience is what a person defines it to be. Recovery, and resilience is what a person does for themselves. Treatment and rehabilitation are often something that a clinician does for someone, when it ought to be with someone, but we're not, you know, we won't talk about that <laughs> um, for now. That's, that's another uh, workshop. 
But um, but yeah, those are all great answers. I'm going to just in the amount of just for time, I'm going to move on. But those um, there's lots of more to talk about here. So let's do a poll just based on what we talked about. You know, that that um, what it is, what it's not, what it means for people. To what degree, if you could launch that poll, to what degree do you feel your service is providing a recovery or resiliency focus of care. This is anonymous, so be honest. You think it's a high, very high degree, a high degree, a low degree, or a very low degree. Right now, not what you're aspiring to and not what people believe in. I'm talking about the implementation of it. To what degree do you feel your program is providing recovery, resiliency focused care. I cannot see the result. The um, so you Here, tell I me can... time to end the poll. Yeah, I'll share the results. Now everyone should be able to see those. Let's see. Okay. Can you see those now? So this is actually pretty good. Um, most people are not. Um, in a high degree, a very high degree um, in, in our system in general, but we've got 56 and 12. So we have eight, 68% feel that it's at least being addressed. It's in a high degree or a very high degree. And nobody says that it's a very low degree. Just 32% say it's a low degree. And that's probably about, about it. So that's a really good answers, really good answers. That, that makes me feel good because when I be guys telling the group before we started, when I started in this field, I would say that 98% was in to no degree. And um, and that's about where we stood. So we've come a long way. Do we have a longer way to go? We do, but we have come a long way. So I'm going to just go through a few things about recovery that I know you all know, but we'll talk about a little anyway. And that is that there are certain assumptions that we have to kind of accept to believe in a recovery and resiliency focused practice. Remember, I'm not talking so much here about thinking as I am about actual service provision. All right. So one of them is that recovery can occur without professional intervention because recovery is what we do. It doesn't need somebody to stand over us as we do as individuals, not as supervisors. I mean, we are the, the, um, the leaders and the rulers of our own recovery and resilience. Um, and they, um, it, there's some things that help us to move forward in recovery. You know, people like to say, I empowered you, but you really can't empower another person. What you can do is create an atmosphere where that person can feel empowered and empower themselves. And you do that by being the kind of person who is there to stand by someone um, where that can hold someone's hand as they go on their own recovery journey, can offer them the services they want in the amount that they want, in the time that they want of their choosing. Sometimes, you know, when I started in this field, this will be shocking to you. When I started in this field, they said that people couldn't work while they still had symptoms. That was one of the rules. And um, that just doesn't work. You can enter recovery and journey in recovery, even though your symptoms reoccur. Many of us have things that we battle with every day, symptoms of certain kinds of challenges that we have, and we, um, we learn to live with them, deal with them, and incorporate them. Um, and we've said before, it's a unique process. Everybody's journey is their own. Um, it, it has to be their choice. You have to have your own choice for where you're going. And the last one is the one I really want to point out, which is um, that recovery from the consequences of psychiatric uh, or mental health or behavioral health challenges um, is sometimes more difficult than recovering from the actual challenge itself. Now, this is old. It's from 1993. So please excuse the language. 
Um, but in those days, this is what we said. The feeling is still there. Um, we used illness a lot more than we use it now. And what would I mean by that last one or what Bill Anthony means by that last one is that when you are challenged by certain behavioral health issues, you wind up with stigma, discrimination. Sometimes you can't get a job. You wind up um, with poverty. You wind up homeless. You wind up um, segregated from family, sent off to other places. And those consequences of those challenges wind up being sometimes worse than the original challenge. One of the things one of the members of my team pointed out to me at our last planning session, which I really have been thinking a lot about, and I, I think that as supervisors, and we'll touch on this again, it's something that I'd like you to think about as you supervise YPAs. And um, for YPAs to think about when they work with youth is that because of the consequences of the behavioral health challenge, some of our YPAs and the youth they work with have developed behaviors that work for them, but they may not be the behaviors they need now for their current role. And they may have been doing those behaviors to survive a life of discrimination, poverty, segregation, and stigma. And that might have worked. And we cannot expect them to change that behavior overnight because we said so. And now they have a job and they have to act a certain way. So I think again, it's all individualized. We need to um we need to know that people have a life. We all have a life. And um and that we develop some defenses that work for us at one stage of our life that we then have to undo at later stages in our life. You know, that's why they say that therapy should be developmental. It should be, um, it should be sporadic at different developmental stages of your life when you need to address different kinds of things. Is that kind of clear? It's kind of a long-winded piece, but I think it's very important for us to understand the consequences of being diagnosed with something. Um, there's a lot of consequences to that. So recovery could mean a lot of things. Um, and um, although, I, you know what? That is my slide, which I will fix. Those little question marks shouldn't be question marks. They should be dots and I apologize. But recovery is, um, it's sort of a catch-all phrase, and I've used it this way as well, so I don't want to confuse anyone. It's a process rather than an end. So, you know, we think of recovery-oriented process. It also is strength-based rather than symptom-based. So we don't want to think of illness and um, things that are wrong. We want to think about things that are right, and it involves hope, respect, and empowerment. And, um, and those things that, that are good and wellness. Aside from that, it's also a model. There are recovery-oriented service provision. In the clinical world, there's a lot of recovery-oriented service provision that you're taught in different ways. You can provide recovery-oriented service provision in a locked inpatient unit. Um, so it's really about how you are providing it and your headset. And that's what creates that model rather than the process. So I would say, again, these are the kinds of things that I think of when I think of recovery. I think of hope. I think of empowerment. I think of self-responsibility. And I think of meaningful roles. And this last one is extremely important because for many years, we thought of the first two or even three but we didn't think of the last one is which is what gives you hope and a sense of empowerment and a sense of self-responsibility, having a meaningful role. You know, there were times when adults with, with mental health or behavioral health challenges were told, you'll never marry, you'll never have children, you'll never have a job, you'll never go to school. That really happened. And unfortunately, it sometimes still happens in places. Um, 
But that's just not true because what gives us a sense of purpose, a meaningful role, whatever that role may be, it may be student, it may be worker, it might be mom, it might be friend, it might be volunteer, but that is an important part of who we are. And if you think of yourselves, what's meaningful to you, you know, is it being a part of a band? Is it being a part of a book club? Is it being a part of Thanksgiving dinner? Is it being a part of volunteering? Um, what is it? It's a meaningful role of your choice. You know, Edie, it just makes me think about what a powerful role youth peer advocates play in helping people discover that. Oh my God, yes. Um, you want to say a little more about that, Anne? Because that's such a that's such a. Um, I just, you know, I think that especially for young people who, you know had challenges for a period of time they kind of it's easy to lose yourself in that right and sometimes it takes somebody outside of you to say you know you you, you you're you've got all kinds of things that you could do that you're good at that that ways you can contribute and people will value that and value you and i just really think sometimes it takes somebody else who has been in that place themselves where they can't see themselves in that way to 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 bring that out in a person absolutely I want to add to that as well, because I saw it the other way, Anne. I thought about the powerful role supervisors have when supervising YPAs mm. as well, right? Because sometimes you get into these jobs, and, and we talked about this in the last in webinar, um, the series number two, in the group that I had, we talked about how you get into these jobs, and it's not clear what your role is. So you know you're a youth peer advocate, but you're not sure. You didn't know it came with all this paperwork. You didn't know it came with all this responsibility, but you you figure it out as the time goes on, but it becomes a barrier. So you thought you were just coming in to advocate and you're actually doing a bunch of other tasks and responsibilities. So supervisors have that power as well to give young people those meaningful roles as YPAs. Yeah, yeah, that's so that's so great. And it's sort of like this discovery process, right? Where everybody learns what, what they really are good at. Um, yeah. yeah. And you know, it's really interesting because a lot of my work has been um, with adults and you get someone who's, um, you know, 30 years old and they're now in a place where, or 20 something years old, there's the symptoms they were dealing with all their life of kind of calming down. And they realize that they haven't had all the experiences that young people have. So between the time that I was 16 and 30, when I entered social work school, I did a million things and went, I lived in California with a band. I entered social work. I entered college as a phys ed major. I changed my major a hundred times. I graduated with an archaeology degree. Um, and, you know, it was like I, I experienced, I worked all over the place. I experienced all kinds of things. And people who are busy experiencing and dealing with either poverty, uh, having enough to eat, finding a place to live, or, um, or some kind of symptoms that are stopping in them in their, you know, in their um, addressing life or substances that are getting in their way, don't have the chance to experience all those things. And that makes them then um, unable to have that big array of of meaning uh you know of what what meaningful role do I even want uh so um so I think that it's very important supervisors play a very important role I agree so it took a while but in 2011 our federal um, SAMHSA folks came out with really accepting recovery pushing recovery and they have been leaders and they made this statement <clears throat> about people's potential um and health and wellness and then they separated out kind of the four areas that they felt were most important and, and look at them they're all the what we call the social determinants of health you know it's about physical health um having a stable place to live having some meaningful life and purpose and being a part and giving back to community and i think that 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 these are the things that really make for recovery they're not a reduction in symptoms. They're not an adherence to medication. They're not um, going to a day program every day. That might be steps somewhere, but they're about 
feeling good and having a meaningful life and having good relationships with family and friends and loved ones and feeling like they're put on the face of the earth for a reason and that they're able to follow through on that reason. And you know, everybody on earth deserves that. Not just people with money, not just people of a certain um, gender or ethnic group, not just people who have a certain physical or behavioral um, health uh, array, everybody, everybody deserves to feel this. And as supervisors, we have the ability to 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 impart this information on folks who work with youth at a very important part in their life a very important point when they are making decisions about their future in these kinds of areas so it's a lot of power so let's talk again a little bit, okay? Chat box, yelling out, whatever you like, okay? Tell me what's different about recovery and resiliency-oriented service provision. You know, we've talked a little about it. What, what's different? Think of your own practice, okay? Think about what you knew before and what you know now. I know for me, I was not taught there are two experts in the room. I was not taught that. I was also not taught that every human being can recover. I was taught that some people you had to do maintenance with. Those are things that I was taught in school in the dark ages. And I had to learn them differently to have recovery oriented uh, service provision. What else is different? What have you learned that's different about recovery um, oriented service provision? Chat it in, yell it out. Yeah, you can unmute yourselves. We've given you that. Uh... There's no set time for recovery. Yes. No... Absolutely, Jackie. I think what's different for me, what I've learned about recovery-oriented service provision is, and I can't find the word, but calm. Like, it's not chaotic, yeah. right? Like, it doesn't have to come with chaos. It can be harmonized. We work together as a team, right? It's shared, right? It's not just power over. Absolutely. So what are the skills needed by YPAs to deliver real recovery, resiliency oriented services? Because that's what we hear talk about. What skills do we need to help YPAs gain in order to do this? Um, ah, Jackie, very good. It's not just about a reduction in behavior. Yep, that's what's different. So what skills do YPAs need? If Chat it in, yell it out. The ability, the ability to develop a wellness plan and the, a correct understanding of harm reduction. What does it mean to meet somebody exactly where they are without um, bias and allow that person to bank on their self-efficacies at the same time they're developing them and moving the process forward. Excellent. And here's some answers in the chat box. Effective communication, being able to listen, patience, reflective listening, leadership schools, um, understanding co-occurring disorders and how they overlap. Great answers. I would also say um, that we need to have an understanding of how to navigate situations where we might be exposed to vicarious trauma. Yes, absolutely. And for those of you who are here, stay tuned because in the best practices, um, in the best practices uh, webinars coming up, we're going to be talking about just what Robbie is talking about. We're going to be talking about vicarious trauma, burnout, compassion fatigue things that um, that were not looked at for ages um, and, and are really, really important. So thanks, Robbie. So last question, how do we assist YPAs to value their own unique contributions as well as the unique contributions of the youth they work with? 
just as you're thinking, a couple of people on the last one, the skills, optimism and um, positivity and how to change from the negative to the positive. Very good answers. Edie, so, the yeah. answer to that last question, I would say to praise them more often. Yes. Mm -hmm. To let them know that they are valued. Yes, absolutely. Add to that, Jackie, because I was thinking today, like helping, like, so when I was a youth peer advocate, my supervisors helped me overcome imposter syndrome. So to Jackie's point, even though you're an advocate, you walk into rooms and you don't even think your voice matters. Or, or you walk in a room or you're on a Zoom call and you're scared to participate because you don't think you're you're adding value to the conversation. But first, you have to feel valuable, you know? And how do we how do we build that within youth peer advocates? Yep. So they're saying positive feedback, strength-based approaches. Absolutely. Very critical, Tiara. I agree a hundred percent. Okay. It's also about, you know, they're learning and respecting the fact that learning is a process, right? So there's going to be uneven mm -hmm. sometimes and to really not awfulize uh, things that might go wrong because that's how you learn and how you find out what you're, you know, how you grow and how you find out where your skills are. Yeah, you know, yeah, and not shying I, away. Go ahead, Nivia. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, not shying away from those uncomfortable conversations, right? So I think about staff that I've worked with who have very strong personalities, right? And there are other people who would say to me, like, I don't understand how you would work with that person, and I'm like, I, I was that person. <laughs> you know what I mean? So like, being able to sit and be uncomfortable and cry in supervision and be frustrated. And not telling your staff, we're not here for that, right? Like I've had supervisors say that. However, that's when the growing happens and the growing pains <laughs> come with the growing of the job. A hundred percent. And you and know I, what? Um, I disagree with that. And I'm sorry. Uh, as a supervisor, um, there's only two reasons why you hire people. Will you do the job that you're trained, that we're hiring you to do? And will you show up to do that job? Because I find in supervision now that part of the problem, especially with, with the advocate who is not really trained that well, doesn't have enough training, that you have to, I find that I have to frame the work. We're here for the work. Now, if you need a lot of motivation and you're still working with your recovery or whatever your personal situations may be, that's really on you and not for the workplace, the workplace and, and teamwork. It's about the work we do. How do we develop the work we do? How do we move the, the client or the member forward? I really don't have time to, to be a, a coach to my team. Coach yourselves, this is about the work. And that is the job, I believe, of a supervisor to stay within the framework of supervision, to understand what the frame is and move the, the, the employees forward. Well, that's my opinion. So we're going to talk a lot about that and, in the best practices. Um, we're going to talk a lot about how the, you know, the fine line between supervision and therapy um, you know, we're talking about folks who may or when people are ready to work. Um, and we're going to begin to address all of those things because just like recovery, there's kind of no one answer and no one path. So um, those are great points. And we're going to, um, you know, we're going to move forward with really. Wait, Edie, I have to, I wanted to say something um, real quick. Um, um, one, in addition to um, Charlene's point, um, I understand your perspective, but I think there's more layers to supervision than just task orientated, especially when you're hiring individuals with lived experience. So we cannot expect peers to always come in polished. Um, as supervisors, sometimes we really have to put in that footwork because these peers do come with a lot of expertise, although they have lived experience. Also, to answer the question about the unique contributions, I think one thing we also have to notice as supervisors is that we all we we um report to someone else hiding us. 
And usually in reporting to someone else hiring us, we usually tell them different aspects that happen in supervision, whether that's with your peer or not. And we have to really assess, does the supervisor's supervisor understand recovery? Because most of the time, information is trickled down from the top. And if my supervisor's supervisor don't understand recovery, and my supervisor is articulating my situations to their supervisor, their response may be way off than what my supervisor would have initially done to help me. So we also have to understand the layers of people that we report to and also how to understand how to kind of not sugarcoat, but frame certain situations in a way where non-peers will understand. Yeah. And you know, I mean, this is like, and I'm not even paying folks to do this. We are going to really talk a lot about that in our last webinar on managing up, which is, um, you know, how how we get folks to, um, who, who we supervise to get us what we need. But what's interesting in this conversation, and um, and that's what's most important, is there are many pathways and many beliefs to move forward. And then there are many different personalities of the people we are supervising. And there are different needs for all of them. And so, um, so I think that it's good for us to be open-minded about which directions to go to. So let's um, go through a few more things of information and say, what do services look like if we're looking at them through a recovery lens, okay? And what is the implications for what we actually do for our service provision? And <laughs> the implications are that things are not, it's things that people have said, things are not exactly the way we all expect it to be. We're not just here to reduce symptoms. We're not just here for the youth. We're not just here to make sure they go to program, that they go to school, that they do what they're supposed to do. Um, <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that we are here to help people have a meaningful life. And we're also um, the implication that young people have a level of expertise themselves. They know what they're doing. There's two experts in the room. And we need to make sure that this recovery vision is driving everything we're doing and thinking. By the way, this is much harder than it, than it looks. Um, much harder. It, it seems like, as I said, mom and apple pie, but it's not. It's hard to actually change what we do. And, um, you know, we want to make sure we, we pay attention to poverty, um, to homelessness, to the things that um, that are the consequences of, of being labeled with something. And we want to make sure that we're instilling hope and belief. Um, we want to believe in change, both for the YPA we supervise, um, I think Nivia said it really well that we are supervising people. Some of them are brand new to the field. You know, here's the other thing. Know yourself. Some people love to supervise. I mean, I have a friend who really only wants, he, he loves when people come fully formed. That's his favorite. I like when they come like a lump of clay, <laughs> you know, I just like to, it's a bad analogy of a lump of clay, but you know what I mean? I like to help people discover themselves. It's what I like. So we need to know ourselves and, um, and figure out what, what, you know, what, what makes us happy. So if you're going to deal with a traditional a traditional kind of service provision, a recovery resiliency kind of service provision, you have to change your thinking and focus. And there really is a shift. And again, this is e harder than it looks. So instead of barriers first, it's always strengths. Instead of what's wrong, it's what's unique about you. You know, some of the other things that that my illustrious colleagues have pointed out to me is that, um, and it's true, something that maybe was symptomatic or a bad thing, like someone with a big mouth who's always got something to say, what a great advocate that person turns into. Did you ever see a young kid who's like always arguing, you say, boy, he's going to be, she's going to be a politician. She's going to be an attorney, you know? So you want to look at the uniqueness of someone and you don't want to constantly think about what they don't have. You want to think about 
what special thing there is that someone does have. And biggest issue, mutuality means there are two experts in the room. The youth and the YPA when service provision is going on and you and the YPA when supervision is going on. Because that YPA has something to give back to you as well as you giving back to the YPA. That's part of the CAST principle. Whoops, wait a minute. The what? The CAST principle. That's one of the CAST principles. Ah, uh, yeah, the CAST principle. Yes, yes. Yeah. Jackie, you know, we're dating ourselves now. These are the child and adolescent service system program principles. But I remember, you know, that, you know, are very consistent with what you're talking about, Edie. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, so let's talk a little bit about um, power robbing language and empowering language. And again, I'm not going to go through every one of them, but we have talked and talked about how language is important and it's very, very important. Um, and there are ways that you can ask questions. And this is again, parallel process. I'm gonna say it over and over again for your interaction with the YPA and the YPA's interaction with youth. So if you say you should have, rather than, you know, here's another possibility, you could consider this. You need to do this, you must do this. Instead of that, you say, well, that's interesting. Have you considered this? Let's look at some other options. You know, in the adult world, there's all this liability if you think someone should take medication and they choose not to. And there's all kinds of arguments about that, or not so much anymore, but years ago when we began this. And what I used to say to folks was, if you say to someone, I really feel you should use this medication, they say, I don't want to. You then would say, well, this medication will help you to do this, 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 and this. Have you considered, you know, whatever. Um, let's talk about why you don't want to. Well, I'm a young person and it affects my sexual ability. Well, okay, let's look for one that maybe doesn't. Or I work and I'm sleepy all the time. Well, maybe we can talk about how to change the dosage or when it gets taken. So again, you're shifting the way you're speaking. And you don't want to say to someone, you know, you can't do that. What you want to say to someone is some things that worked for me are what has worked for you in the past. They're very small shifts, but very powerful shifts. I wanna to add to that, Edie. So, so as you're shifting language, you're also shifting how a youth peer advocate is thinking, right? So um, I I used to sit in this meeting at, a, at one of my old jobs and one of the directors would complain and say, I'm tired of thinking for my staff, right? And sometimes I've been in workspaces where I haven't even been given the opportunity to think and supervisors are like, so this is how we're going to do it, or this is how we've been doing it. And it's like, well, I want to contribute and language creates a space where there's mutuality. It also creates a space where people won't get defensive, right? So when you say to me, you should, the first mm -hmm. thing I'm saying is I'm not, right? right? Like that's what <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> All right. Don't even finish the sentence. And I get that. I get well. this other, yeah, there, there are things that we have to do, right? Like there are things like documentation, like there are things that have to get done. But when it comes to I'm planning an event, ask me, did I consider inviting the other agency, right? Don't say, well, why didn't you? Or like, we got to put in the time and put in the footwork that Nivea was talking about, because then your staff begin to show up with more confidence. Then the staff begin to feel a little bit more invested in finding their purpose when they feel like they're able to do something, right? And lack of a better term, like this, this is a way that adultism manifests itself. When you tell young people what to do, and I love how you put it's power robbing. It's not power sharing at all. You're taking away my power by utilizing words on the left side of the chart. So thank you. No, I agree. You know, words are very powerful and they hurt. 
Don't think they don't hurt. So this is um this is a quote from a very um wonderful adult peer advocate um uh who who I just adore and I've had the glorious pleasure of meeting and chatting with a number of times. She writes beautifully aside from thinking beautifully. She wrote this quote about powerful language. And again, it uses those illness concepts. And I apologize for that. But um, but let's think about it. Once a person comes to believe that he or she is an illness, there's no one left inside to take a stand toward the illness. Once you and the illness become one, there's no one left inside of you to take on the work of recovering, healing, or rebuilding the life you want to live. And any of you who have any kind of ongoing issues, physical or behavioral, I have an ongoing uh, medical condition. You can really connect to this. If I had all these years let this medical condition take over my life, I would not have been able to have any joy. And so this is the power we have as supervisors. When you're listening to a story, when someone is sharing with you their interaction with the youth, do they see that the youth is a person? Are they, are they supporting that the youth has ideas and hopes and can grow up and grow past whatever challenges they have? Are they helping them see that? And if the YPA is currently not as polished as you'd like them to be, are they living in that diagnosis or that, that label that they've been given? Have they become that label? Do they need to find themselves to allow the youth to then find themselves? And this is another power we have in our hands as supervisors is to explore who the YPA wants to become in their life and to help them get there. So why shift? Why should we bother to do any of this stuff? Why don't we just go ahead? We got things to do, people to see, places to go. Because it's very good. Because people get better and they succeed and they feel better. And the youth is better and the outcomes are better. What happens when that happens? Your revenues go up. Your reputation goes up. There's all kinds of administrative things that happen. Everybody wants to be on your board of directors. Staff want to come work for you. Um, everybody works harder when the goal is their own, when the goal is to, is to have a good life and get something that they want. And, uh, and good things happen uh, in the long run. It's like money you're putting up front, time and money you're putting up front to get the end result that you need. To get, as you said before, the billing done, the documentation done, the outcomes reached. You're going to get all of that, but you got to put in the time in the beginning. With so that. One thing I like to always remind people is remembering that work is a part of recovery. Oh, yes. Right? Like that's an aspect of recovery. And, and as we are working with um, young professionals and even entry level positions, because not everybody supervises the YPA, but you might have a youth engagement specialist, right? Like whatever you're calling the position, how are we helping young people define what it also means to be an advocate? Because not everybody advocates the same, right? So figuring out, right, how, what kind of supports your particular population needs, right? So the way I speak when I go to New York City is very different, and I'll be honest, than how I speak when I'm in the Hudson region, right? And understanding, but I had to figure that out. So what are we doing in supervision to help youth peer advocates figure out for themselves who they are? Are you going to be a Malcolm X? Are you going to be a MLK? Are you going to be a Gandhi? Like, who are you going to be, right? So I just want to um, put that out there. And that it's our job as supervisors to figure out what kind of teams we want to lead and what roles we want people on those teams, on our team to have, right? Because it's we manage tasks, not people, right? So we lead people. So how are we leading the YPAs to be their fullest, fullest selves, right? And everything, their recovery is not in our hands, but we are a part of it. We are a part of a young person's recovery journey, especially if they're working with us. 
if I Absolutely. might, it's wonderful, everything you said. That's wonderful for team meetings. That's wonderful for team building. Supervision for me and for my organization is about the work. And we used to do all of that. We used to involve, talk, talk about another person's recovery, make sure that they understood what the wellness plan was and how to frame it. And, this, and then the eight areas, we used to do all of that in supervision. We still do it in supervision on, on a case. However, we found that we had to separate from the work, from the personal part of, of, of our, our, our staff because the work is about our members, helping our members to move forward. And the better we tighten up the skills with, with our employees, it moves the work along. And there's no room for me in supervision. I don't really wanna hear that you're not feeling well. I want you to bring your notes. I want you to talk about your plans and what are we doing for this member? And yes, we have to develop you, but not supervision. Supervision is about, for me, is only about the work. So Charlene, you know what? In the next, I hear you totally. In the next two webinars, we're gonna talk a lot about the parallel process. It's about getting the work done by helping the YPA to be able to develop those skills that they need to get there. Yeah. And on how those two things match each other. Okay. Because okay. what happens is if we don't address the things we're talking about now, we never get to the place that you want to get to. A lot of turnover. So Absolutely. I hear you, you're a hundred percent right. But the trick is to balance it and to figure out how we can get to that promised land. Absolutely. How are we going to get those outcomes? But on the way, we're going to create um, a situation where someone can grow into their job and their job skills and out of a place of non-recovery. And it's a very delicate balance. It is not easy. So hang on, because we got lots more to talk about, about what you're saying. And I hear you 100%. Okay. Okay. So you're going to get a chance now to break up into just 10 minute groups to talk about these. So you're going to be randomly put in a group with Ann, Tiara, Robbie, and Nivia. And each of you are going to talk about one of these and we're going to come back and just spend really uh, recorders because it's 3.30. We're just going to spend two minutes each on, on the talk back. So a quick 10 minutes. Um, it's a great group. I've got great stuff in the in the in the chat box and the comments are terrific. And um, let's break into those groups, Vanessa, and have a chance to chat. And again, really just a very quick 10 minutes. So again, in the interest of time, just a, you know, a one or two minute capsulization of your very too short and I apologize conversation. Um, so Anne, what about do I need to rethink the way we deliver services? So um, we didn't even get to everybody, so people can chime in. But um, we talked. Charlene talked about how important it is for youth peers to feel good about their role, like as opposed to feeling like somebody else's role is more important. But like their role is important, and their role is a career, and their role has specific expertise and specific skills, um, and how to help them really stay in that role, um, as opposed to drifting over to doing something that looks like clinical work, right? Um, yep. That's not their role. Um, and then um, we talked a little bit about the parallel process. Um, and, you know, this is, Dale was talking about how important it is to the way that you supervise in terms of being recovering resiliency oriented can very naturally become the way that the peers work with the youth and the families that they're working with. So that he's really kind of signing on to or endorsing, I guess, your concept there with that parallel process. And um, Dulce chatted in, um, and sorry, Dulce, we didn't get to talk with you about how, um, how important self-awareness is. And so keeping a focus on self-awareness with with, in supervision can help people really themselves then support the young people to themselves become self-aware. And Dulce, if I'm misrepresenting your comment, please unmute and chime in. But that's a quick summary of what our group talked about. Anybody from my group wanna, wanna say anything more? 
Yeah, I'll add in, um, yeah, the, the time was very short, but I'll add in that um, the way that youth peers should be delivering services um, is very aligned, uh, should be aligned with how, uh, let's take the CFTSS manual, for, for instance. If you look at the delivery of services there, those service components of being a skill builder, um, supporting their uh, self-advocacy, self-efficacy skills really defines the work that they should be doing with the young person um, and can really help the peer, the youth peer to do work that's aligned with those service components detailed. Thanks, Amari. Well, that's great. So again, I don't mean to cut anyone off, but just in the interest of time, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna move on to the next question. That's why we kind of broke out, let y'all have a couple of minutes to really um, talk a little bit longer on the topic. Um, Tiara, how can my own motivation and beliefs help or inhibit my capacity to deliver truly recovery-oriented supervision? So the, the main theme in the group really was the importance of connection. And when you believe in empowerment, it kind of just comes out naturally when you're doing service delivery. So it'll definitely um, help motivate and um, guide the recovery-oriented supervision. We also talked about how when your vision is so strong, it can, you don't, you want to be humble enough where you don't want your vision to overpower the youth advocate's vision, right? Like give them space to share their beliefs and yours shouldn't overpower them. Um, we also talked a little bit about being adaptable. And if if the work's not okay, if the if the participant, I'm participant, if the YPA is not okay, the work won't be okay. So your own beliefs and your own motivations guide recovery-oriented supervision. So if you find yourself not being in alignment with recovery-oriented values, it'll seep out not just in what you say, but also in what you don't say and what you don't do. So that's kind of the, the quick synopsis of what we went over. Yeah, it was good. That's really great. Thank you. Um, Robbie? How about um, what barriers must be identified and what struggles need to be developed to work through them? All right. So we had a lot. And uh, like I'm sure everyone else, we didn't really get to finish our conversations. <laughs> but I'm so, sorry, everybody. No, 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 no. It was, it was great. I, I, I loved it. Um, but so we wanted to look at how to build trust with YPAs, um, honoring the fact that like they have their unique qualities and uh, also instilling the fact that they have control of their narrative when they are strategically sharing. Um, transparency uh, within like the YPA workforce. So wanting or trying to learn how to kind of foster that rapport with YPAs where they feel comfortable going to their supervisors for guidance rather than feeling like they have to uh, prove themselves constantly was another thing. Um, boundaries. Uh, documentation, and then continued role clarity were other barriers and things that uh, we were trying to look at developing as well. Excellent. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot to work through. And um, Nivia, you had number four, what are the outcomes for YPAs and for services when it is accomplished that you can um, look at everything through a recovery lens? Mm -hmm. So um, we have a display of empowerment and hope, self-value, self-advocacy and resilience, adequate and effective services, meeting the youth where they at, meaning community-based services, learning environment, the how, which can um, result in positive adjustments. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody else have want to add anything to um, to what we said, to what, what the groups went through? Yeah, I was going to put this in the chat, but um, I didn't see Dulce's comment until, you know, we're at the end of the time there. But um, they said, you know, it's really important to, to support the YPAs to see their role as having a positive relationship with a... I think that was so... So that's a great way to describe, you know, the work, because sometimes we forget the positive part, you know, we get all caught up in the must do's. And sometimes we forget the purpose part, you know, kind of hanging out. And I think recovery is really like positive with a purpose. I thought that was great. So, yeah, it's a great way to say it. 
great way to say thank you, everybody. Again, I'm sorry it was so short. Let's talk a little bit more um, about a few more things and just put it in its context. Um, okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the peer-to-peer -peer relationship. Um, we know this, so I'm not going to go through it, but it's really about mutuality, um, being strength-based, being trauma-informed, and um, and again, remember the parallel process, um, you know, the way we deal with the YPA, the way that we're expecting them to deal with youth. Next slide. And again, the key values of a peer relationship are, um, are the same thing we've been talking about. We want to make sure that we're supervising people in a way that's allowing them to work with youth with these key values. And how do we do that again? I'm sounding like a bro broken record <laughs> by, um, by making sure that we deal with our supervisee in this same way. Next slide. So let's look at what supervision would look like if we were doing it through a recovery lens. Okay, Vanessa. So am I having a recovery focused supervision conversation? These are the kinds of questions that you could be asking in supervision, okay? And it's important again, remembering the kinds of things we were talking about, that you have stuff you gotta do, all right? And you gotta get outcomes. But are you using recovery language? Are you, you know, falling on old clinical language? You don't want to go there. You know, you want to stay with no jargon, with clear talking. Are you listening and not just directing? If you're not getting an appropriate outcome, are you asking why? Rather than just saying you have to do this, you have to do that. Um, are there choices and options? Um, <clears throat> You know, are you leaving out threat and coercion? And um, and are you talking about recovery, not just stability? And um, and and are you designing everything to build self confidence? And again, you are doing the parallel process for the YPA and the youth. Oh, okay. So I stole this slide from someone, and I thought it was great. Um, it was supporting a successful supervision dynamic. And you can see the supervisor does one thing, the youth peer advocate another, and, um, and it helps you to kind of move along in the process. And again, this is, I wanna spend a minute on this. It's a parallel process. The supervisor needs to be able to lead and inspire to facilitate effective dialogue, engage in learning and nurture relationships that work. That's how you're going to get the outcomes you want, by doing that. The YPA is the one with the youth who hold the hope, who create a partnership, who engage in recovery-oriented dialogue, and who build confidence and competence. But you could whack this around, really, because it is a parallel process. And remember, the way that you develop relationships is going to be the way that they develop relationship. I lost it again, Vanessa. Next. So make sure that when you're dealing with a YPA, you're building resilience. Just going to bring your, your eye to the last one. Believe in and spread hope and the belief in everyone's ability to grow. The YPA sitting before you may not be fully formed. This is a golden opportunity to help them to develop the behaviors they need to be successful in their job. Next, please. How do you do this? Because everyone's saying, that's very nice, but how do I do it? And we will be discussing this in depth in the next two webinars by doing best practices. Can you go back, please? So it'll be having a mindful lens for your supervision, being trauma-informed, person-centered, and managing reactions to stress. And I am not gonna spend time on this because we have a whole webinar that's gonna be talking about all of these things. But that's how you begin to do this supervision and get to where you need to get to. Next, please. So as 
a supervisor, you need to do all these things, not just one, because they're all interconnected. You are a teacher and you are a coach and you do have to be reflective and you do have to problem solve and you do have to have a big, a strong partnership. But doing that will help the YPA to grow and achieve the outcomes that you so much need in your work. This is going to create the ability for them to do the work. Next, please. Next, please, Vanessa. So I'm going to take one minute, next, please, to talk about this. And you all know what self-care is. I'm talking about self-care, not just for the YPA, but for you. I am talking about supervision as self-care. Next, please. It's not simple. It's easy to say, much harder to accomplish. Next, please. But if you do, supervision itself can be self-care because good supervision results in less interruptions for your day. It results in better outcomes, your documentation being done, your outcomes being reached, everything working better and the work getting done. And with that comes a very strong sense of accomplishment. Next, Vanessa. Finally, to wrap up before I pass this back over to um, Anne, don't forget stigma. Stigma is all around us. These myths are all over the workplace and it's our job to actively battle against them. Young people, there is a horrible myth that young people who have behavioral health challenges can't do the work, that they're costly to employ, and that they're going to replace clinical workers. None of this is true. And it's our job as supervisors to help people understand that these are myths and that they're not being supported. Next. Think about your own supervisory relationship when you're thinking about stigma. Do you believe deep, deep, deep in your heart that everyone can recover and everyone can have a valued role in society? Or deep, deep down, do you believe there are some people who can't? I'm going to tell you that in order to do this, you have to really dig deep about um, the ability to people to get what they need to get and to address it. Um, those are personal decisions. I'm not even going to say much more about it. I'm asking you to think about it. Make sure you have the tools that you need and your wellness tools and that you're not overstressed by what's going on. And that's how you begin to combat stigma. Next, please. Understand and promote recovery. Be aware of all the things we talked about. One more. Make sure you integrate um, the YPAs into the workforce. Uh, these are all things we're going to talk about as we move forward. And the last one. I want to leave you with this thought because all the other stuff I whizzed through quickly, we're going over in the next two webinars. <clears throat> Young people can challenge us. They challenge what's ingrained in us. They challenge our thinking. They reflect on the challenges. Um, you need to reflect on the challenges. And I'm asking you to partner with these YPAs to change systems, policies, practices, and culture. This is how we move into a recovery and resiliency-based practice, by embracing the change and the difference. Because as I said last time, it's a gift to supervise someone with a different point of view. Um, and you've been given that gift. So, um, so play with it, have fun with it, enjoy it. Don't see it as a burden. And Anne, I have left you about three minutes and I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> but that's I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody, uh, where can we find this PowerPoint presentation? I just wanna know where we can find this PowerPoint. 
So um, all the slides and the, uh, the recording of the uh, webinar will be posted on the CTEC website and you will get an email as an attendee in a couple of days and it'll let you know that the, the webinar has posted and where to find it. And Thank Jackie, you. all those issues at the end, we're going to go over in the next two webinars in much more depth. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. And the next one. Okay, so um, these are just some resource slides. When you get the slides, you'll be able to click on these links. They don't work now, but they'll work when you pull up the slides um, to help you find this slide and the next slide, please, Vanessa. Um, they'll help you find some resources to support your work um, as a supervisor of youth care advocates. Um, some of those are on the CTEC website and some of those are on the Families Together website because we partner in, in the work that we do around youth care support. Next slide, please. Um, the, this, these, so also, uh, when you get the slides, you can click on the recordings from webinar one and webinar two if you missed those. So we put those links here for you so you can find them easily. Um, and we'll add webinar three the next time, Jackie, so you'll have that there as well. Next slide. Um, and this is, a, again, another link for you to sign up to future webinars. And uh, uh, Vanessa is going to be posting a link, if she hasn't already, in the chat. Um, for you to um, give us some feedback on today's webinar um, and also to identify any particular topics that you want to be sure we cover in the future. Um, I really want to encourage everyone to come back for the next two. Well, we have three more webinars in the series. Um, and the next two are uh, part one and part two of best practices um, in youth care advocate supervision. Um, for those of you who have already signed up, we have had a date change, so you'll be getting notification about that. The webinar that was scheduled for November 9th is now going to be on November 14th, um, and then the other webinars will stay the same. So we'll we'll communicate with you about that, um, but we really hope to see you back here, um, and um, we are delighted that you chose to spend an hour and a half with us today, and if you could take a minute to fill out that survey, um, we'll leave the webinar open for a minute so you can get that link. Um, and I want to take an opportunity to thank our, our wonderful team um, together in New York State, um, Ravi and Tiara, Nivia Jackson, who's from the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, um, and Edie, uh, for just really helping us think through some of these really important issues around supervision. And I'd like to thank all of you for participating and sharing your ideas. That's how we continue to grow and develop is by bouncing ideas off each other. So I really appreciate everyone, uh, everyone's input today. So thank me you so much for, uh, yes, Edie? No, I said me too. Thank you, oh, you so too. much, everyone. Okay. Uh, stay tuned. Uh, and thank you to everyone. our CTAC team. Thank you to our CTAC team member, Vanessa, who was wrestling with Zoom the entire time. Zoom decided to uh, have an opinion today. Yes. <laughs> uh, so thanks, Vanessa, as well. All right, click on that link, and, and we'll leave the webinar up for just a second so you can um, get that, and then um, we'll see you, see you next time.